minute. Uh, okay. I think I think we can get get started and you open the show, Hillary. Okay, great. All right, so good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Madison Art Society's art lecture, Power and Remembrance, Reclaiming Black Lives Through Art, presented by Bob Potter. My name is Hillary Griffin, and as president of the Madison Art Society, I'm very happy to be here with you today to tell you a little bit about the Madison Art Society and to introduce you to our guest speaker, Bob. Some of you are already familiar with Bob, uh, who has given a series of art history lectures during the past couple of years, which were very favorably received by our Zoom attendees. And if this is your first meeting with Bob, um, I think you'll very much enjoy his presentation. Before we begin, allow me to remind you about some of our Zoom points of etiquette so that we can have a smooth art demonstration this morning. Everyone's microphones are set on mute and will remain so throughout the demonstration. Please keep your mics muted during the duration of the demo unless we're in the question and answer sessions, either at our halfway point or at the end of the demo, where you will be asked to use the raise hand feature or the chat feature if you'd like to share a question. And also please be sure to have your volume up at a nice level so that you can hear Bob clearly and he will be also introducing some video throughout his presentation. And we'd like you to be able to hear all of that as well from the various artists that he's presenting to us. So a little bit about the Madison Art Society, if I may. We were founded in 1976. We're a nonprofit art society with 250 members from Madison and beyond. For 47 years, we've been promoting the arts and encouraging artists from the beginner level to those at a professional level. And we strive to promote and encourage art within the broader uh, Madison community as well through art exhibitions, opening receptions, plein air paint outs, um, still life meetings that we have throughout the winter and these Zoom presentations, as well as other art events that we plan throughout the year. Each year we have about three art exhibitions. Um, one is taking place, it will open on Monday and that was what I was referring to uh, just a few moments ago for any art members out there of the Art, art Society, please submit by six o'clock today p.m. Um, to onto the website and then tomorrow you'll turn in your work at the Scranton Library and the show will be up for about six weeks at the library. So please everybody be sure to go take a look at that. It, it's sure to be beautiful. And also you're all invited to the opening reception, which is March 3rd from five to 7 p.m. It's a Thursday and those events really are a fun night out. Um, just wanna let you know too, we have a juried show in May. Many prizes will be awarded to the award-winning artists and it will be juried by a professional artists. So that will be a wonderful event as well. Again, with an opening reception, I'm sure that'll be lively and very well attended. And as I said, we hold many other art events throughout the year. Please go to Madison Art Society, ct.org to check out what we do and please join us, become a member if you have not yet done so. Now let's turn our attention to Bob this morning, to Bob Potter and allow me to read Bob's bio. Art lecture presenter, Bob Potter is a graduate of Syracuse University's School of Visual and Performing Arts. He spent his early career as an art director at Scholastic Magazines, Time Warner, and National Geographic. Over the past decade, he helped create an arts therapy program for Save the Children, was a corporate development officer for the National Gallery of Art, headed marketing for Mystic Seaport, and is a docent at the Yale Center for British Art. He and his wife, Jean, who is a master watercolorist and teacher, live in Old Lyme, Connecticut. So the floor is yours, Bob. Thanks, Hillary, and uh, good morning, everyone. Um, it's nice to see you all again on Zoom and uh, looking forward to uh, spending about 45 to 50 minutes together. And we'll take a break <clears throat> about the halfway point uh, and uh, can address a few questions then. Uh, and then at the end, as Hillary said, uh, there'll be an opportunity uh, for uh, questions and discussion. And I do wanna thank uh, Hillary and Jen and Marianne and the Madison Art Society for hosting uh, this 
uh, art lecture. So let's get started. Voila. And uh, Jen and Hillary and Marianne, how does this look? Everybody see this on the screen and can Looks hear good. me? Looks fabulous. <clears throat> great, great. Well, what I want to share with all of you today is the portrait art of contemporary African American artists who've created powerful images of the Black experience in America that echo their own personal journeys. Portraits that reclaim back black lives through the art of the portrait. And today we'll be looking at works by uh, artists Romare Bearden, Amy Sherald, Carrie James Marshall, Barclay Hendricks, Titus Kafar, and Kahindi Wiley. And this is by no means an exhaustive retrospective of black American art. Um, these are just some of my favorites, but certainly some of the most prominent artists. Throughout the history of Western art, people of color have often been relegated to unidentified, subservient, marginalized roles. In this portrait of a British soldier and nobleman, painted by Sir Joshua Reynolds in the late 18th century. History knows who the man in the armor is, but nothing about the young black figure in the painting. The role of the young black aide de camp in this painting is to hold his master's helmet and gaze upward in servitude and admiration. History knows all about the man in armor, but nothing about the black figure. He has no identity. His role is to represent British power, wealth, and enslavement. In another 18th century portrait painting, a daughter of British wealth and society poses with her pet dog and is attended by a black enslaved young man. He wears a metal collar with a bell, just like the dog. This early 18th century painting depicts Yale University's early benefactor and namesake, Elihu Yale. He's the man sitting in the center between his two son-in-laws, whose marriages to his daughters, Catherine and Anne Yale, has been brokered with the vast wealth that Elihu Yale had amassed as the head of the East India Trading Company. We see the examples of this trade on the table. The man standing in the back on the left in drab brown is believed to have been a lawyer who helped seal the deal. By all accounts, this is the most successful of marriages. William Cavendish, the second Duke of Devonshire, sits on the right in blue velvet, and his younger brother James on the left in bright red. Yale's grandchildren play in the background, and an enslaved child stands in the lower right, serving Madeira wine. We know everything about the men in wigs, but nothing about the identity of the young black servant with a silver collar and padlock around his neck. Over the course of the 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries, many children of African and Indian descent, mostly boys, were separated from their families to serve as attendants in wealthy households in Britain. Often these children were forced to wear metal collars with a padlock, like the one seen here, to identify and recapture those who ran away. The 
The artist Titus Kapar, a Yale School of Art graduate, reimagines the painting of Elihu Yale to make the young black enslaved servant the main focus of the painting. He repaints the original painting to size, crumples it up, repaints the young black boy's portrait with him now looking at the viewer and frames and mounts it on the crumpled canvas. He titles the painting, which I think brilliantly speaks for itself, Enough About You. This will give you a better sense of the scale of his painting as they mounted on the wall at the British Center in a recent exhibition. Titus Kapar was born in 1976 in Kalamazoo, Michigan. His first introduction to art was in a junior college art history course. And he taught himself to paint by visiting museums. He received his BFA from San Jose State University in 2001 and his MFA from Yale University. Titus Kafar says this about his art. Much of black history recorded in Western art is summarized visually by three roles, enslaved, in servitude, or impoverished. In his portrait of Thomas Jefferson painted in the neoclassical style, <clears throat> Jefferson is literally unraveling from the painting, revealing a nude Sally Hemings portrait in the background. The juxtaposition of the fully clothed Jefferson with Hemings nudity reinforces the unfair power dynamic between the two and revises Jefferson's public image to include his sexual relationship with his much younger slave. Sally Hemings had at least six children fathered by Thomas Jefferson. Wow. Four survived to adulthood. In these portraits of contemporary Black women, the artist is literally cutting out of the canvas their children, Black children, too often lost to their future lives, lives sometimes of violence, drugs, imprisonment. In a 40,000 square foot former ice cream factory in New Haven's largely black and brown neighborhood of Dixwell, Titus Kapar and Yale School of Architecture Dean Deborah Burke have created a light filled industrial studio, a workspace for young artists from New Haven, a workspace called Next Haven, N-X-T-H-V-N. The artist Amy Sherald was born in 1973 a year after I graduated from art school, which really makes me feel old. She was raised in Columbus, Georgia. She currently lives and paints in Baltimore, Maryland. Amy is passionate about painting and says, quote, art is all I have. It's what I wake up to do. I'm lost without it. Here's Amy Sherald in her Baltimore studio. As an artist, she has had to create her own identity. She grew up in a household where art had no home except for a painting from Ethan Allen in the family room. She also had to wait tables until she was 38 to support her art career. Growing up in Columbus, Georgia, Amy was very shy, self-conscious, a self-described introvert. 
She stayed inside during recess. She would say, quote, art class was my safe haven. One of the reasons she enjoyed art, she says, was because it didn't require interaction with people. In this painting entitled, Miss Everything, Unsuppressed Deliverance, done in 2016, Amy Sherald subverts and reinterprets iconic images like Alice in Wonderland. I'll let the artist explain her painting in this video. A lot of the pieces that I make, I think they start in a place of fantasy. Miss Everything was inspired by Alice in Wonderland. The big dress, the teacup, you're left with the impression that she's playing dress up, but that she's also striving for something different than who she is and seeing herself in a way that other people may not see her. Miss Everything is who she is now in this present moment. The idea of being seen as anything other than the color of her skin. Her name is Crystal. It took us about an hour just for her to relax to give me that pose where her shoulder went up and her chin went up and she just became Miss Everything in that, in that one moment. I wanted that painting to be relatable. I feel like there's a way that anybody can connect to it. I really want people to be able to write their own story. Like, who do you think this person is? Why do you think she put that on this morning? I wanna lay the image there and just let it be and see how it develops as, as people interact with the, with the image. Her life-size portraits of African-American figures, either three-quarter or full length, are set against a vibrant color in a dreamlike state of imaginary space. A man holds a sailboat that floats above his open palm. Is this a reference to slave ships? Another man has a horse's head hanging from his neck. Is he the beast of burden? A man with an eggshell blue bow tie and sherbet yellow striped coat pulls a rabbit from his straw hat. A female jockey holds a white unicorn hobby horse with pink halter. These are paintings that inspire you, the viewer, to make your own interpretations, to write your own narratives. This famous photograph from the 1930s always gives me vertigo to look at. It's a photo of steel workers on their lunch break, dangling hundreds of feet in the air above the New York City skyline. Amy Sherald reimagines this scene by painting a lone black man with a bright red woven cap, a person of color who is conspicuously absent from the original photograph of all white workers. The painting's entitled, If You Surrendered to the Air, You Could Ride It. She does admit that it can be a challenge to separate Black people from history and politics defined by color. Although many of her paintings are infused with fantasy, she also creates portraits of everyday people. Amy Sherall painted Mrs. Obama's portrait in a flowing white gown with colorful geometric patterns and shapes that captures Mrs. Obama's modernity and openness during her tenure as first lady. The design is 
The dress design is based on what the dress designer, Michelle Smith, says was inspired by a, quote, desire for equality, equality in human rights, racial equality, LGBTQ equality. Here's a wonderful photo of Mrs. Obama and the artist, Amy Sherall, unveiling the portrait at the National Portrait Gallery in Washington. The next artist we'll meet is Romare Bearden, who was born in 1912 in Charlotte, North Carolina, to a nurturing family. I got to see a retrospective of Romare Bearden's paintings at the National Gallery of Art when I worked there over a decade ago. And it was a revelation. Because of the poor economic conditions and brutal racial discrimination in the South, where Jim Crow laws were upheld, more than 6 million African Americans would migrate North from 1915 to the 1970s. The artist Romare Bearden and his family joined the great black migration north, moving from Charlotte, North Carolina to Harlem, New York in 1915, where he would grow up in a vibrant political, artistic and cultural life of the Harlem Renaissance. And he would visit the South for family reunions. He's the cute little boy in the sailor suit in the center of his family photograph. Music and childhood memories were two of the greatest inspirations in his artistic expression. For Romare Beard and Jazz would inspire his vibrant collage paintings, like this painting, Jazz Village, done in 1960. He was also inspired by the stories he heard growing up of life in the South told by family members who moved North. These would become another powerful source of inspiration. In this work entitled Sunset Express, created in 1984, a family gathers around the making of a quilt while seen through the open door in the background, a train with its engine smoke. The train is a symbol of both the migration of Southern Blacks to the North and also the soundtrack of Black American lives with the train's whistle and vibrating steel rails, creating the sounds and rhythm that would influence jazz. Bearden would return again and again to scenes of childhood and family in many of his collage works like this one, entitled Evening of the Gray Cat, where a man strums guitar. And if you look hard, you can see the little gray cat in the lower right. Music and memory are a returning subject of Bearden's painting, especially in this work, Piano Lesson, done in 1983. This work would inspire Pulitzer Prize winning playwright August Wilson to create his 1987 play, The Piano Lesson. Wilson says what first intrigued him about the painting was the relationship between the two women the one at the piano as a child, as the other grown woman leans over her. As August Wilson set out to write a play about these two women, the scope of the story grew dramatically. The piano became a central character of the play and the legacy of a broken African-American family in Pittsburgh who had migrated from the South. The family's grandparents, who were slaves on a Southern plantation were separated and sold in exchange 
or the piano. The shocking incident causes cross-generational traumatic incidents for the family as they try to retrieve the piano as the play unfolds. August Wilson loved Bearden and would say about his art, quote, Bearden's art in particular has been influencing me because of the manner in which he treats black life in all of its richness and fullness in a formal artistic language. And he connects it to the great traditions in art, but his subject matter is the black experience in America. Carrie James Marshall is one of the most influential artists working in America today. His work echoes a sentiment that other black artists have expressed. He says, quote, I call attention to the absence of the black presence. We could not refer to our role in art history because we did not play a role in art history. He goes on to say, quote, all my life, I've been expected to acknowledge the power and beauty of pictures made by white artists that only have white people in them. I think it's only reasonable to ask other people to do the same vis-a-vis -vis paintings that only have black figures in them. Carrie James Marshall was born in 1955 in Birmingham, Alabama, which at that time was one of the central stages on which the civil rights movement played out. Martin Luther King called Birmingham America's worst city for racism. Birmingham was a Ku Klux Klan stronghold. When Carrie James Marshall was eight years old, Birmingham was the site of the 1963 church bombing that killed four black schoolgirls. Two years later, when he was 10 years old, he and his family moved to Los Angeles to a housing project in Watts. Their arrival coincided with the 1965 Watts race riots, where 34 people were killed and more than 1,000 wounded, and more than 3,000 were arrested. The memory of these events had a profound effect on the artist. He feels that, quote, it shaped the person I have become. He would graduate in 1978 from the Otis College of Art and Design in Los Angeles. His father was a postal worker and his mother a homemaker. At an early age, he was entranced by art history books and museums even though he almost never saw anyone who looked like him in art books or in the museum galleries. Let's listen to the artist, Kerry James Marshall, talk about his work in this video. And again, make sure the sound is up on your laptop so you can hear this as well. What you hope a retrospective shows, in a way, is that your career was a thoughtful one. Embedded in imagery is a narrative of change and transformation and growth. Mastery is an important concept. It implies having achieved a certain level of proficiency that gives you the freedom to do what you want without fear of the consequences. In the entire narrative of art history as we know it, there's not a single black person who has achieved the title of master, certainly not an old master. Mastery means that one is able to self-determine, to determine how one wants to be represented, how one wants to be seen. I tried to make a commitment to the craft. Everything about the picture is in my control, but I'm not working in a vacuum. I'm working in a culture that has a history. The goal was ultimately to be free, 
and to not feel compelled to compromise ideals, vision, or integrity in order to just fit in. And if ultimately the museum was a place that I wanted to go, I didn't have to abandon the black figure in order to get here. I decided early on that you have to be able to see evidence that I experience pleasure, that I experience pain, that I have desires, that I'm aware of history, that I'm a political creature, that I'm also a social creature. That's what it means to be a complete human being. I think that's true freedom. In this untitled work from 2009, we see a black woman artist holding a very large palette and a paintbrush. The colors she is painting correspond to the paint by numbers color on the canvas behind her, which suggests she is painting the same portrait as evidenced by the outline of the same chair she's sitting in. Is this a commentary on art, on making art, and asking the question, does a black artist have to make art in a certain way for the art to be acceptable? Does it ask us who decides what is art? Is there really such a thing as black art? Gary James Marshall can be mysterious, packing his painting with symbols and visual metaphors, superstition and African mythology. Here, a black magician levitates a floating woman. A black cat arches its back as a snake slithers by playing cards scattered on the floor. And what does the date 7-11-21 mean? Is it a date in time or numbers individually that mean something to the artist? In a painting called Past Times, done in 1997, he depicts an idyllic world of sunny summer play, a family golfing, boating, picnicking, the American dream that many white Americans would instantly recognize. The artist might ask, is there anything about this painting that looks different to you and why? In May of 2018, hip hop producer and rapper P. Diddy bought Marshall's monumental painting, Past Times, with a sum of $21.1 million. These two portraits are part of a series that Marshall painted of young black cub and boy scouts. He suggests a kind of idealized youth accented by an explosive burst of radiant light silhouetting their faces. This painting is titled Lost Boy, AKA Black Johnny, painted in 1993. It's one of a series of portraits of young black men the artist calls the Lost Boys. These paintings in this series are in dramatic contrast to the young scouts. In a series of nine paintings that Marshall created in the 1990s, which he called the Lost Boys, it's a tragic and timeless memorial to the violent deaths of young black men. <clears throat> Harry James Marshall explained this series as follows, quote, well, what brought it about or where the idea originated had something to do with a slightly autobiographical situation. Not myself directly, but my youngest brother who ended up in prison. He spent seven years in prison and went into jail just shortly before I started the Lost Boys series. He goes on to say about these paintings, quote, a part of the reason I started that group of paintings was a reaction to how I felt about him being incarcerated. I mean, it's one thing when you know other people or hear about people who are taken to jail or to prison, and especially through certain violent kinds of acts or incidents, but it's another thing when it's now at home and it's your own brother. 
I mean, the impact of that experience was really kind of extreme for me. I've always been interested in children's literature because there was a point at which I had wanted to be a children's book illustrator. And one of the books that struck me was Peter Pan by J.M. Barry, and the whole situation of the lost boys. You know, the group of young boys who were lost down in Never Never Land, where they never really had to grow up, a kind of willful underdevelopment on their part. But if I apply that concept of being lost in a never, never land to a lot of young black men, where in some cases it wasn't that they had a willful desire never to grow up, as much as they often never had the opportunity to grow up, because there are far too many young black men cut down very early in their lives, you know. I think we could take just a brief break here for a few minutes. Yes, it's 1040. <clears throat> so it's a good spot to stop. Why don't we see if we have any questions? Let's check the chat. Okay. Anybody want to ask Bob anything at our intermission right now? Maybe we can just stretch a little bit. So far, so good, Bob. Good, thank you. Very, very good. Indeed, um, do you know save or your questions if you like towards the end. There's plenty of opportunity for some comments and discussion. <clears throat> and some of these works may be new to many of you, as may some of the artists. Part of this lecture series is, is really hopefully to encourage you to go deeper, to uh, go online, uh, go to Google Images, <laughs> Google the artists, uh, and to learn more about their works. They are very, very active artists um, and working uh, in a contemporary world and providing their viewpoints, their response, both personal and public to the world they and we live in. Well, let's mm -hmm. keep moving on. One moment, we do have um, excellent presentation so far from Liz Scott to everyone. Thanks, Liz. <laughs> um, a lot of sorrow, Stephen Wolfson but I don't see a lot of anger. Anger would be justified. Mm. Steve's insights. Yeah. Well, I must say one of the pleasures of, of doing an art lecture <clears throat> like this is that I discover new artists and I'm, embarrassed to admit that one of the artists I really didn't know about until a year or so ago was an artist right here in my backyard. I live in Old Lyme and uh, the artist Barclay Hendricks from New London. His works are part of the collections of most major museums in the world, including the National Gallery of Art, the National Portrait Gallery, the Philadelphia Museum of Art, the Studio Museum in Harlem, Tate Modern, and the National Endowment for the Arts, just to name a few. He was born in 1945 in North Philadelphia and his parents moved to Philadelphia from Halifax County, Virginia during the Great Migration. He attended the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts and after graduating in 1967, enlisted in the New Jersey National Guard and found work as an arts and craft teacher with the Philadelphia Department of Recreation. In 1970, he began attending Yale University and graduated in 1972, the same year I graduated from art school at Syracuse. He graduated though with both a bachelor and master's degree. I only 
graduate with a BFA. He would become a professor of studio art at Connecticut College, where he taught drawing, illustration, oil, and watercolor painting and photography from 1972 until his retirement in 2010, when he became professor emeritus. When we look at his full length, vibrant portraits, we see an artist in full command of the art of the portrait, who gives each subject a powerful presence in the use of color, how he poses the figure, their dress, their attitude. The man in a pink suit against a pink background is one of my favorites. Notice how the subject's head and hands are silhouetted by pink. He does this again in this full length portrait, but now a man with a white suit against a white background. He further enhances the personality of the man through a sense of style, fashion, and cool. I can't help but see his influence on some of the Amy Sherald portraits we looked at earlier, especially the figure posed against these bright, almost neon background colors. On the right, his painting, Lottie Mama, done in 1969, was one of his earliest portraits. And he includes an arch top and a background in gold leaf that suggests a Byzantine icon. In the mid 1960s, while touring Europe, he fell in love with the portrait style of the masters, Anthony Van Tyck, Velasquez, John Singer Sargent. This portrait done in the mid 1970s shows off his mastery of the figurative painting and personality Sure, it would be a wonderful portrait of a woman lounging, much like Sargent's painting Repose on the right. And I think Sargent would applaud the composition, the figure, the portrait, the way the artist thinks about portrait art. But Barclay Hendricks gives it that extra pop, literally, as the woman is about to pop or pink bubble gum. Let's look at this video on the artist Barclay Hendricks. I know what I want to do, and if it sort of attaches itself to certain areas of the culture, that works out great for me. If I want to take a little bit here, a little bit there, that's my priority. That's my inspiration. I'm just trying to do the best painting of the individuals that have piqued my curiosity and uh, made me want to paint them. When I was in London, I went to the National Gallery and there were students doing copies from masters. This is in 1966. And I saw a painting that kind of rocked me and I wanted to do a copy. So I went out to get supplies and something hit me. It was like a bolt of lightning. And it said, you can't copy somebody else. That was a significant moment in my life that if I was gonna be involved in art, it would have to be from me. I'm trying to make a statement on my own with a degree of history and the materials and techniques. When I first started painting, most of those paintings were people that posed for me. 
when I was at Yale. I was assistant teaching, and Jules was a part of the class. Jules was a beautiful, skinny dude. I guess he's about six, 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 seven. I asked what he said for me, and he said, yeah. Neither he nor I cared about nudity, and he was hip to work with me there. My camera I call my mechanical sketchbook. It allows me to get information, and I'm fast but I'm not as fast as the camera. Sherry used to work around the corner and walk past my studio, and I asked, could I photograph her for a painting? So I decided to do a mirror image of sorts. Then I added little touches like the fingernail, toenail polish. Photo Bloke was a man that I photographed, Bread Street in London. There are other situations where I have photographed people Africa, France, wherever I've traveled. Colors are part of my creative arsenal. There's also a color choice because certain statements are made more powerful. I like fashion. As I have scanned my body of work, there is that timelessness that could be labeled part of the fashion statement that I'm involved with. I had a girlfriend from Slough who used to call me Brown Sugar. And I did a self-portrait called Brown Sugar Vine because a vine is like, man, that brother's wearing a nice vine. But this is nude, so Brown Sugar Vine became the title. I've been painting for 40 years. The very fact that, you know, I'm doing black people, you got people who are thinking, it's political. I get <laughs> all kinds of different thoughts about what my painting's about, and many of them don't relate to the areas of inspiration. There should be a degree of mystery. What can I tell you, you know? You know enough. I want it to be what I call memorable. I don't want it to go poof. You go into certain galleries, there are a lot of other artists there. So, but I'm damn sure I want you to remember mine. Sadly, Barclay Hendrix passed away a few years ago. The last artist we'll look at today <clears throat> is Kahindi Wiley, who is deeply invested in art history with a respectful knowledge and appreciation of the art and artists that have gone before him. But his work celebrates life today, reinterpreting and challenging classical images and ideas to celebrate contemporary Black lives and Black life. The artist Kahindi Wiley was born in Los Angeles, California in 1977. His father is from Nigeria and his mother is African-American. <clears throat> Excuse me. He earned his college art degree from the San Francisco Art Institute in 1999 and his master's of fine arts degree from Yale University School of Art in 2001. His work challenges the way blackness is portrayed in art, asserting that modern black folks should be worthy subjects for a stained glass window or in a mural size figurative painting that dwarfs the museum goer. Wiley understands that art is about power and he unapologetically inserts the power of his black subjects into paintings based on well-known historic works of art. Growing up roaming museums and pouring through art books, Wiley of course knew Jacques-Louis David's famous painting done 
in 1800 of Napoleon crossing the Alps. But he reimagines it for a hip hop world by substituting himself as the black figure in camo fatigues and Timberland boots and creates a cultural mashup that is as powerful as it is visually stunning. And when seen in person, it knocks you out. This was the first Kahindi Wiley painting I ever saw and it knocked me out. And then I kicked myself thinking, why didn't I know about this artist before then? I saw this work at a retrospective of Kahindi Wiley's paintings at the Brooklyn Museum in 2015. This gives you an idea of the impact of his work on view at the Brooklyn Museum. Philip II of Spain had Peter Paul Rubens do his portrait, a stride a stallion in 1628. In a portrait commissioned by Michael Jackson before his death, Gahindi Wiley appropriates all the royal trappings of the 17th century equestrian portrait of King Philip II of Spain, and why not? He copies the same armor and sword but the horse is way more cool. And again, the monumental size of the painting is in a word, awesome. <clears throat> Mimicking the grand portraits of the 17th and 18th century, he grew up looking at in museums. <clears throat> Wiley appropriates in portraits of contemporary men, but he sharpens the viewpoint, portraying these men even more unabashedly and physically present in both posture, street style, and elegance. He will often set them against elaborate backgrounds of intricate flowing patterns of color and design. His portraits of contemporary men of color celebrate such a rich diversity of individuals. The artist bases these portraits on photographs of young men he sees on the street. They're dressed in the clothes they wear and are asked to assume poses from paintings of Renaissance masters. He engulfs the subjects in swirling patterns of color that are balanced by their calm and composed determination, self-awareness. His portraits of women present a timeless beauty in classical poses of elegance, but also strength. These are women who project power. They are completely self-aware. In a painting like this, Gehendi Wiley is not just appropriating classical subjects from the Renaissance paintings of the body of Christ dramatically foreshortened, as in this Renaissance painting from 1480. He forces us, the viewer, to think about Black lives in new ways, finding a common humanity through the timeless imagery and power of art. He flips history on its head in other ways, no more so than in his official commissioned presidential portrait of Barack Obama, where once the idea of a president's portrait was one of symbols of power, as in the Gilbert Stewart portrait of George Washington done in 1796, Wiley gives us a president in a garden of symbolic plants and foliage that mirrored different places 
in the president's life. And imagine my surprise as a docent at the Yale Center for British Art when a few years ago, I discovered this painting among the 18th and 19th century portraits hanging on the walls of the museum's fourth floor collection. I literally had a whiplash moment. Once again, Wiley disrupts the narrative of visual history, especially 18th century portraits of the landed gentry out for a day of hunting. And he not only substitutes the man for a contemporary black woman wielding a rifle surrounded by the day's fresh kill of rabbits, but his model is the contemporary British artist Lynette Yeodem Boche. Here we see her in her studio and an example of one of her portraits of black men. I'd like to finish today's lecture with this short video on the artist Gahindi Wiley, where we have the opportunity to listen to him talk about his work. Everyone is fascinated by looking at another human being. There's something very intimate about the ways that people assume that by looking at certain parts of the portrait, they'll be able to understand who these people are, where they come from, and why they happen to be in this museum today. In my work, I try to slow down and see individuals. I'm standing on the shoulders of all of those artists who came before me, but here there's a space for a new way of seeing black and brown bodies all over the world. A New Republic is an exhibition that allows for every single moment within my career, all of the different acts, all of the different bodies of work to be seen. What you get is a diversity of experiences, a picture of what black American kids are up to, a picture of what the global story is with regards to how young people adorn themselves and celebrate and fall in love. It's really interesting to be able to look through the history of some of the great portraits and to say, what is it about the trappings of empire and power that we can use in the 21st century? What does it look like to be graceful? What does it look like to be proud, noble? How do you look at a young black man in American society? It's a very important question, especially at this moment in our culture. The way in which the body is seen has a lot to do with light. How does the artist choose to allow light to flow across the body? For the last 10 years, I've been obsessed with stained glass. What I wanted to do was to create a body of work in which empathy and the language of the religious and the rapturous all collided into one space. Black women have always been at the core of my thinking around portraiture. You see so many portraits where the male figure stands dominant at the forefront of the painting, and women and children and land are seen in equal measure as possessions. In my own work, the women are strident. They take the front. But there's also a sense of mystery. We don't really know who these women are. Bound is a sculptural project that looks at the presence of black women, all of those women that raised me, the graceful women who've been in my life over the years, but also the ways in which black American women adorn themselves as both a type of communication act and armor. And hair is principle within that. You see hair going outside of itself, becoming so fabulous, so extraordinarily large that it folds in under its own weight. It's beauty that becomes decay. It's a place in which the imagination starts to happen. The Brooklyn Museum is extraordinarily important for me. I remember having my first exhibition here. 
being able to celebrate this moment in a place like Brooklyn, where so many of the people who are in these paintings come from, is an incredible blessing. In some sense, what I'm trying to do is to come to terms with the ways in which black American culture has been beamed out into the rest of the world. And that is a type of new republic. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this lecture. And we looked at a lot of art together and I hope 